This series was made possible by the kind support of Main Street Partners, a London-based independent and dedicated sustainable investment advisor that provides ESG multi-asset and multi-manager portfolios and a range of holistic portfolio analytics tools, including sustainability ratings and bespoke sustainability intelligence. It was also supported by Carbonado Partners, an industry expert in capital raising for all asset classes that endeavours to provide thoughtful solutions that address emerging managers' perspectives and challenges. Our next guest started in the City of London in 1968, after his life plans were literally shattered by a skiing accident. Let's hear how he has been guided by the KISS principle of keeping it simple in an extraordinary career that has now spanned over five decades. Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Julian Turgoning, who has worked in the asset management business for many years, having had senior roles in the Flemings Group, where he also covered Latin America, and at BNY Mellon. He is now a chairman of Halo Global Asset Management. He is a member of the Investment Committee for Seoul, a multi-employer defined benefit scheme for the non-academic employees of the University of London, which is where we met. Welcome, Julian. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Evelyn. It's lovely to be with you, particularly with an Irish lady, because you, I think, uh, come from the Dublin area. And I was at a preparatory school in Kells for five years. And of course, I think I'm right in saying the Book of Kells, the famous Book of Kells, is in Trinity College, Dublin, Library and aren't you an alma mater? Uh, proud or graduate of there, yes, indeed, indeed. Well, uh, see, we're, it's all coming full circle already. Let's go back to your upbringing, where you grew up, and how those five years factored in, and how you ended up ultimately choosing a career in investing. I'll try and keep that pretty short. Strange enough, going back to Ireland for a moment, my parents went to live in Ireland in the back end of the 1940s. We were living in Northern Ireland, and yet I was sent to school in the south and went there in 1955. And in 1956, my parents moved back to England, but left me in Ireland. I was incredibly happy at Hedford House, just outside Kells. I used to go backwards and forwards in in Viscount aircraft from Mare Lingus, but also on the ferries from Holyhead to Dublin and so on. I then came to school in England, and I then had a gap year, which it would be called a day, where I spent seven months in France working in the wine areas of Bordeaux, Champagne, Burgundy, and the Rhone. And in fact, wine has become an enormous hobby of mine. And happily, because of lockdowns, I have a quite significant cellar below me where I'm sitting at the moment. But I digress. I then joined the Navy by going to the Dartmouth Royal, Britannia Royal Naval College in Devon. And I was always interested in boats. I'd learned to sail at the age of about 12. But my career in the Navy came to a rather chattering, literally, end because I skied for both the Dartmouth team in the Inter-Services Championships and also for the Royal Navy team the next season. And I had a massive accident on the top of the World Cup course in Kitzbühel, which is probably the most difficult World Cup course I've ever skied on. And I spent a month in hospital there and two months in hospital in the UK and was invalided out of the Navy. And so I had to find a job. And what I really wanted to do was to join something like Christie's or Sotheby's. But there was always going to be more months left at the end of the money. And I eventually found a job in in Save and Prosper in the city where basically I could balance the month and the salary and also live in London. But I have to say, I joined Save and Prosper knowing what a 10 shilling note was, but I knew nothing about (laughs) investment at all. (laughs) So it was a strange background, but it was fun. When you were laid up with your injury from the Navy, from the skiing accident, that's often a time when people sort of reset or they have a time of great contemplation when they can't go anywhere other than a hospital bed. Did you do any contemplation or planning at that stage? It's quite interesting, actually. You mentioned one particular thing. I was in enormous pain immediately after the accident, and I had temperatures, you know, in the hundreds. Somebody brought me some old Reader's Digest magazines, you know, these rather small magazines that were published. And they had some lying around the hospital. And I read something about gassing people in the First World War in the trenches of the First World War. And that immediately brought me down to earth and thought, there are a lot of more people who were much more damaged than I was. 
And that actually made me much more robust in dealing with pain and, and dealing with the recovery and the fact that I had to change careers because it was obvious to me I was never going to be able to, so to speak, stay in the Royal Navy. And then it sounds like you had almost like a traditional apprenticeship entry into investment if you came with no prior knowledge, but you learned on the job? Yes, it was. I learned on the job quite quickly. And I think if I was lucky, I joined what they call a graduate trainee scheme. But to be perfectly honest, it wasn't. It wasn't properly formed then. But what I was lucky about was that later, I managed to be invited to attend meetings. So it's a word I'll probably use again, but through osmosis, I learned a lot by just being invited to attend meetings and you're often keeping my mouth shut, which is probably quite difficult now, but was less difficult then. And I learned an enormous amount, if you like, on the, on the proverbial hoof. And so then tell us about your trajectory through the world of asset management, maybe touching on how you came to Latin America as a coverage area. That came a lot later, but I suppose, again, I had a great bit of fortune in my very late 20s. I was 29. I was sent off to Jersey to run the international companies of the group, which were scattered at various countries, both in the Caribbean and in in the Far East. And that gave me an insight into, it was really what I called my first command. I was away from head office It was a business that hadn't been very well run. But what then happened was that we doubled our profits every year for the best part of five, six, seven, eight years from a very low base. And it became a very successful business. I much enjoyed living in Jersey. And because it was a small place and I was running quite a a reasonable sized business and a growing business, I was sort of quite prominent in the island. And that certainly helped me develop my career. But it was my first real experience of managing people and I joined with a, a team of about 13 or 14 and left it uh, some years later with closer to 35. That was a very important part of my early working. And then I came back to London and I joined the group board eventually and did a lot of different roles. But I very early on became a man who was running the investments business. I wasn't necessarily running money. I had been a bond and money manager in the early 1970s. So I knew quite a bit about investment management and and working with investment managers. We were very much invested in equities and not in bonds and not in, if you like, money instruments. And I should say then that at that stage, interest rates had been up to 15 or 16 percent. And so it was a very profitable time to invest in both bonds and, if you like, two, three, five-year term deposits. So again, I learned an enormous amount in that early early stage before I went to Jersey. And I also had worked in what would have been called a USITS fund today, which was based in Luxembourg. And it was really a forerunner of the, if you like, start of the global industry that built up in the European Union. Then I come back to that later in my career. So that was a fascinating period. But then moving on into the 1990s, I joined the board of the Association of Unit Trusts and Investment Funds, and that's called the Investment Association today, and I became uh, chairman of the trade body for the United Kingdom. And then from there, I had joined the uh, board of the European Union equivalent trade body, and I became president of that in 1990, I think it was 1997. I served for one term, so 1997 to 1998. So it was a very interesting period. And during that time, I'd actually moved away from asset management for about three years. And I was based in London, running the operations for the Flemings Group in Latin America. Flemings had been very Eastern centric with a big operation, a joint venture called Jardine Fleming, based in Hong Kong, but all over the really the whole of the Asian region and and down into Australasia. And they wanted to balance it up with some business in Africa, but also in South America, particularly in mining and resources and related activity. I had to go to South America probably twice a month for about eight or nine months every year. And I was given a target by a bank in Brazil. (laughs) I managed to achieve that with help from colleagues in three years. So it was a fascinating period. I mean, I've been to Peru something like 10 or 12 times. I've been to Brazil probably 12 or more times. And dealing with the Brazilians was absolutely fascinating. When we were actually doing the deal, it was like trying to get uh, wet fish into a barrel. You put a 
a lid on it and you'd put a, a nail down at one end, just as you were putting a nail down in the other end, the lid started to flap at the other end. <laughs> but it was absolutely fascinating. And we got on extremely well. I didn't speak a word of Portuguese, but we managed to do a very successful deal. Yeah. I like that image of getting wet fish into the barrel seems the opposite of shooting fish in the barrel. So I can, I, I'm visualizing those negotiations. That seems like a fascinating, I'd say, exotic aspect of your career, that South American travel. Looking back at such a long career, what were some of the highs and lows? Well, I'm not sure. I think I was fortunate. I probably didn't have any lows. I mean, the markets had lows. What most people don't know or don't remember is that there was an absolutely extraordinary bear market from September 1972 to the first week of January 1975. And the UK market which was then measured by the FTSE 30, not by the FTSE 100, which didn't exist then, fell by, I bet you wouldn't ever know the, the figure, it fell by 72%. And the American market had had a similar fall, but it actually finished in about May 1974, and it had fallen by using the Dow, it had fallen by 55%. So these figures were astonishing. And this very long bear market in both the United States and the UK wouldn't happen today because technology doesn't sort of allow it to happen in many ways because the speed of trading and markets is so much faster. So if you then go wind forward, you go on to the Let's just go straight you know, to the end of the century. You had a TMT boom in the late 1990s. It then collapsed in, in effectively the year 2000. And then we had a fairly long bear market by today's standards to 2003. The next layer was the global financial crash of 2008-10. And then, of course, we had this remarkable setback when the pandemic became global in sort of the first quarter of 2020. And then this massive rise from effectively around the 23rd of March to the end of 2020 and into 2021. That was astonishing, that both the speed of the fall, but also the speed of the rise. So I didn't really have many lows which weren't connected either with markets or what was happening in markets. I certainly had some highs when I was chairman of the trade body in the United Kingdom. There were two things that I achieved, but I have to say, with the help of the executive of the trade body, who were very competent people, I became, well, we, there were really three of us working on this, became very aware that obviously the Europe fund management industry was very bond orientated and very much less in equities. Well, we were very dominated by the equity markets and had virtually nothing in bonds. Well, we managed to get through the sort of legislation slightly changed and the taxation changed. And today, bonds and the market, money market funds at the end of January 2020 were something like 19.5% of the 1.4 trillion, just over 1.4 trillion of retail funds in the UK. And that's astonishing. That was a tremendous success. And the other thing that I became very involved with in the markets in the United Kingdom was not just dealing with unit trusts, but also dealing with OICs or open ended investment companies. And they are still there to this day, as are unit trusts, actually. So those were certainly two highs in that period of time, which were, if you like, industry wins, and it became wins on into this century and for the last two decades. Do you count that as your greatest personal achievement, or would that be more of a, an industry achievement? Is there anything else that you could count as your greatest achievement in your career? Well, I was quite good at thinking out of the box. And uh, funny enough, I do a lot of my thinking in the bath, which you wouldn't really believe. And I've actually invented various products in the bath and thought of different ways of doing things over the years. So I think there were a number of things which I did think or did start in the, in the incubation of the bath and went from there. There were the occasional days when I probably never... I was probably lying in a bath which had become quite cold, but I was so busy thinking of, of, of something else. And to some extent, I do that to this day. But there are a number of things which I did do. I also managed to achieve two very successful sponsorships. The Save and Prosper was the rugby internationals at Twickenham for 12 years at a time when the game was going from amateur to professional. And we decided we couldn't afford to have sort of tennis or football or some other very major sports. And I did a deal which the first part of it lasted for six years. And then suddenly they caught up with us and, you know, it cost a lot, lot more money. And then when I was with Mellon and BNY Mellon later in the uh, 2000s, 
and I did a, a 10 year deal with the Royal Academy based in Piccadilly, and that was highly successful. We were their print only partner, and that took us into the 250th anniversary of the Royal Academy. So there were things which I did outside as well as, who like, directly related to day to day business. And I know you said you didn't have any lows in your career and that maybe most of them are related to markets being low, but I'm sure there were some setbacks or some challenges or maybe investment mistakes that you made. Can you talk about any of those? Well, actually, funny enough, the biggest probably investment mistake I didn't make at those times, uh, it probably was made much more recently. And that was really after the global financial crisis of 2008-10, when I really totally underestimated probably the importance of the United States. So as we moved into the back end of the 2010, 11, 12, and into 2013, I probably completely underestimated the likely strength of the US market going forward. And of course, that was then picked up with the FANGs, the F-A-A-N-G-S, and of course, technology as a whole. Looking at it, if you like, just from a personal point of view, that was something that I underestimated, both for funds that I was involved with or indirectly involved with, which, of course, is now history. And perhaps, I mean, I think technology is definitely here to stay. There's no question of that. Whether it's we're going to have a little setback in the markets, which I think would be healthy to get a bit of a market, would probably be helpful. So that was probably my biggest investment mistake, if you like. I'm sure there were other small things, but it's rather like as a child, you can't really remember the days when it was pouring with rain, but I always remember the sunny days. And it's rather like that. So fortunately, my memory is, is faded on the failures. <laughs> But I'm sure there were some. You'd probably have to ask some of my colleagues. Also, a long career like that will probably give rise to the development and perhaps shaping of various investment beliefs, which maybe you change shape over time. Can you talk about any core investment beliefs that you have now? I've always had one in just about everything I do in life, which is the KISS principle, i.e. keep it simple, stupid. And it's terribly important that one really does understand things, particularly on investment. And that became increasingly complex as we moved towards the end of the last century and into the 2020s. And a classic example, if you like, of perhaps extremely poor management, but also extremely poor misunderstanding of risk, was actually the failure of the Royal Bank of Scotland. And, you know, when we were dealing with things like CDA squared and things like that, it was absolutely clear that that team of people did not understand what they were doing and the, and the bank effectively went bust. And here we are in 2021, with still something like 60% of that bank being now called the NatWest Group, being owned by the state, effectively by the taxpayers. And so KISS, keep it simple, stupid, is a byword that has run through my whole career. I would say other beliefs are definitely diversify. Make sure if you are investing, think about regions, think about company sectors, think about even fund managers, you know, do you want to diversify your assets from being just with one fund manager to more? And then I think there are other things which I think are very important. Beware the long term opportunities. You know, I've mentioned the point about the US market in sort of 2011, 12 onwards. ESG is becoming something it's very interesting. And strangely enough, Europe has been rather in the van, Europe with with the United Kingdom, has been in the van of ESG, environmental, social and governance issues. And it was quite interesting that President Prime Minister Abe in Japan developed a sort of three arrows and governance was one of those. And actually governance in Japan now is a very, very strong area. But of course, the big one for the future is environmental. But it's not just environmental because really we think of it now as climate change. And to some extent, environmental is very important and will be, but climate change is going to dominate companies and their development over the next, what, 5, 10, 20 years. And, you know, China's even talking about being carbon neutral by 2060, whilst most other countries are aiming at 2050. But I think a lot of companies will be trying to think about sort of 2030, 2035, 2040. But there's an enormous amount happening in that area enormous change. But I really, I think coming back to one belief, it would be the KISS principle. That is a good lesson for life indeed. I'd like to have this look back reflection because there's not many people I can speak with who've spent so many decades in the city. In terms of the shape of the city and how it looks now, I'm thinking in terms of diversity and opportunity for all, what are the most notable changes that you saw 
over your decades and working there and how would well, you assess? I, I suppose when I joined, it was it was pretty old-fashioned. I mean, the, the money brokers and the discount brokers still walked around the city with top hats on. And the reason why they did was because when they went into the banks to talk about their liquidity and use of the money markets, they would be identified immediately because of the top hat. And even when I joined the city, there were just everyday stockbrokers and partners in other firms and financial firms, accounting professional firms, wearing bowler hats. I have to say, I never had either, except uh, Top had to go to Ascot in, but that was a different reason. Looking back on it, it feels extremely old-fashioned. I almost sort of think I look at it or think of it now through a sepia lens, which is not entirely fair. The big change started in 1986 with what was called Big Bang. And I think that that really brought in so many changes to the markets. It did two or three things. First of all, it started to bring a sort of globalized market to London, because the United States banks, the American banks particularly, took over stockbroking firms. Then they started to open offices of their own. So you suddenly got the Goldman Sachs and the Morgan Stanleys and, and even Lehman Brothers, which of course went bust, coming in in very, very big ways with massive, massive numbers of staff and doing an enormous amount of trading in all everything from currencies to bonds to equities and really anything that moved. Bitcoin wasn't around then, remember. The development of technology and the developing of the global markets, and London really became the center of choice to New York. And it's probably still there, notwithstanding the post-Brexit situation at the moment, where Amsterdam's trading seems to be quite strong in the first quarter of this 2021 year. But I think, actually, London is so much embedded, let's call it understanding, knowledge, and a very strong professional background, firms, and so on and so forth, that I think it would be very difficult for London to lose its halo. But it's got to work hard to restore it, and not least with the pandemic and the slightly aggressive view that Europe is taking, mostly through probably concern about the European Union fracturing over the next X years. You might be interested, and this is complete personal view, but in 2005, I made a statement that I thought by 2035, the part of the European Union would have broken in some shape or form. And actually, the recent months around the pandemic and vaccines and so on is showing the fragility of some of the decision-making processes, which I saw when I was working uh, within the European Union, you know, 20 or more years ago now. And maybe just any thoughts on diversity now in the profession? Do you think it's as where it should be at? Would you like to see more? I think diversity is here to stay, and I totally support that. When I worked with the Bank of New York Mellon, it was very, very apparent. We had an extraordinary number of nationalities based in the 9,000 people who worked in Europe, most of whom were in London. We had every sort of background you could think of, very many races, obviously both genders. And I think that that is here to stay, but I think that's here to stay right across business, whether we're, you know, you're running AstraZeneca or whether you're in the financial services sector, whether you're working in the city, whether you're working in Dublin. But in a centre like London, it's been a multicultural, multiracial city now for many, many years. And you go there regularly and you, you see it firsthand. You may not have seen it very much at first hand in the last year or other on the Zoom screen, but it's here to stay. And I totally support that. And I think it's going to be a strength of the city. And let's go back to your personal story just for a few last questions. Are there any key people that you can mention that really had an impression on you, whether personally or, or throughout your career? I'm not sure that there were key people. I said earlier that I was very fortunate at a fairly young age to be invited to attend meetings, committees, and sit there sort of silently. But again, there were people who did invite me to make comments. And I think that that was extremely helpful because I saw them in action. It's what I call osmosis. I was sitting around a table with some very bright, very senior people. But I think my timing, funny enough, notwithstanding my accident, my timing of joining the city was lucky. It was the beginning of 1968. It was the beginning of change, which really culminated in Big Bang, as I said, in 1986, which if you think about it, it wasn't that many years later. So I think you know, when I started in 1968 in the city, by 1972, I was doing a reasonably senior job. So that was very lucky. But if it hadn't been for being invited to attend meetings and committees and sit in, I wouldn't have learned so much so fast. 
And remember, I did say I knew what a tensioning note was, but I didn't know what an investment was. But I think there are other things which are very important for other people. I, I feel that it's very important. I had, again, some things which I did a lot of, and I still do to this day. I believe it's terribly important to learn and to continue to learn, and I'm still learning to this day. I always try to listen. Being humble is quite important. Thinking out of the box, I mentioned that in the context of bathing. <laughs> Meeting people and networking, as many people refer to it, I think is terribly important. Now, I think that's quite difficult at the moment, and I really feel for young executives who are trying to climb the greasy pole. You know, some of them haven't met colleagues, but they see them on the screen. But again, you don't really get the effect of osmosis. Please remember the KISS principle. I think that's terribly important. But be yourself and be true to yourself. And the last thing I, advice I'd give to anybody going into the city today, but I'd give that advice going into life today, is also try to have fun. Because if you can't see the funny side of things, you probably become quite boring quite quickly. <laughs> well, I think in that one answer, you've covered wonderful pieces of advice. My last question maybe would be, aside from all of that, is there something that you could, advice you could give your younger self? If you were maybe um, well, to look back. Probably the same things that I've just said, actually. But I think there's one other thing that I would just like to say, particularly if this is listened to by anybody who's sort of quite early in their career, but perhaps as they're coming up towards board level, they should perhaps start to, if they're wary of that, and some people are quite not scared of joining a board, but they're worried and concerned about it. I would counsel that they consider doing something outside their business, like say, joining a charity committee. But it must be a charity that they're interested in, so don't just join any other charity. Do something that's going to interest you. Because seeing people outside your firm and the way they react to issues and the way they behave becomes very important in understanding people. It doesn't have to be a charity. It might be a sports club or a governor of a school. Now, as it happens, in addition to being chairman of the Equivalent of the Investment Association many years ago, and the European equivalent. I was also chairman of the City of London Club, so I met a lot of people in different sectors of the city quite early on. I also became master of one of the senior livery companies in the city, and I was master at the beginning of this century. And the other thing that I did was I chaired a very major public school in Northamptonshire for seven years, having been chairman of the Finance Committee before that. So I was always trying to do things, if you like, outside the envelope of the city, outside the envelope of my job, partly because I like working with people. <laughs> I'm quite collegiate, if you like. And I think that that is very important. And although technology rules today, and I may be a bit behind the curve on some things technological, I do think that those early principles and the fact of doing things outside your the envelope of your day job is very important. So. I would end by simply saying good luck to anybody coming into the city today. But anybody who's thinking of leaving school today or is, is leaving school today to go to university, I would say consider doing something like technology or engineering, not necessarily just economics or other financial subjects. Well, that's some great advice to end on. And I want to really thank you, Julian. It's been a very interesting history lesson, I think, in the city, looking back and also how it has evolved. And I think your ongoing involvement really evidences your passion for this area. And that is very inspiring. So thank you for coming here and sharing your insights with us. Well, I've much enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. And it's always lovely having communication with a, a lady from Dublin. Thank you for very thank much you. indeed. Well, I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest. 